Okay, welcome everyone. I uh, am uh, met today or meeting with uh, Logan Emmett Hurley. Uh, Ogan, uh, Logan is the author of a book uh, titled, interestingly, How to Look Good Naked, subtitled The Least Amount of Effort to Look the Best with Your Clothes Off. So for people listening on audio, I'm holding the book up here. And, uh, and this is a, a very interesting book, which I bought, I believe, back in 2019. When was this written, Logan? Uh, I think I started the idea for the book in about 2017 completed 2018 and then by the time i met you for the first time richard at uh, the resistance exercise conference in 2019 i was able to put it up for sale so it had been about two years previous that i had written the book okay and i i first met logan at the discover strength uh resistance exercise conference which is a really neat thing that um the organization that logan is associated with uh, Discover Strength. Discover Strength is actually a, a number of different strength training facilities. Uh, Luke Carlson is one of, if not the principal there. I think he's got a real team approach, does a really great job. And I was at this resistance exercise conference where they were practitioners, uh, exercise instructors, literally from all over the world. We heard some great speakers. And uh, it was a wonderful thing. Of course, between now and then, there was a pandemic that happened. It got delayed for a bit and uh, they were done virtually. And I haven't been to one since, but I'm very grateful to Logan for Logan or to Logan rather for taking the time to talk with me today. So I know that after reading the book, I know that you came from you're a fitness uh, enthusiast from a while back. But you've gone through different uh, schools of thought, if you will, and different methodology before coming to what I do here. Uh, I often refer to, I know people use different uh, labels, uh, which I have differing levels of comfort with, uh, you know, whether it's HIT or evidence based training or things like that. I kind of like rational training. Uh, or intelligent way of training, but maybe you could tell me a little bit more about yourself for our viewers and listeners, and also a little bit about your story and, and a little more about Discover Strength, if you would. Yeah, for sure. You might have to uh, to prompt me with some of those questions again as we move through this, Richard. That's a lot, yeah. lot to cover, but uh, first and foremost, thank you for having me on. It's always a, a pleasure to talk to colleagues and, um, you know, experience uh, different individuals from around the world that have sort of bought into this uh, high intensity evidence base. I like rational training. I think that's a great idea as well. Um, not unlike most of us, I you know started uh, lifting weights when I was a little younger because I was small. Uh, I wanted to get big. Uh, resistance training allowed me the opportunity to do that. And I remember very specifically, you know, going to the YMCA with my dad as a little kid and, um, you know, testing out in America, you sort of have to, if you're under 14, you have to test out to make sure you're not going to be a, a jerk on the equipment there. So just loving right away that process of, of exercising and seeing people like Arnold Schwarzenegger in the industry. You know, we always used to go to the, the shoot 'em up movies when I was a kid and see right. Arnold with his bustling muscles popping out everywhere. And I was like, man, that would be it would be great to be like that someday. So uh, always strength trained from that point on about 13 to 14 uh, going on through now. So I'll, I'll be 35 uh, here in about another month and a half. So uh, it's been a, been a while and it's been quite, quite a journey. Uh, when I started out, I got really serious about it. End of high school um, kind of coincided with, with finishing puberty and all that stuff. And like many of us, I attributed, you know, the two hours a day I was spending at the gym. Uh, to doing the work for me, as opposed to the uh, the natural steroids that my body was pumping into me, you know, right. being a, a 17 year old male. So uh, I kind of wrongly confused, hey, I'm doing this high volume approach. I'm doing what all the other bodybuilders in the gym are doing. I'm asking, you know, the guy with the biggest biceps for for his best advice, <laughs> um, which he conveniently probably left out had had to do with, you know, needles and other things. Right. So um <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that was that was sort of the the path from then on. You know, I've always loved strength training. I went to school at a, a big university in Florida, um, UCF in Orlando. Uh, that's actually where Jim Flanagan went. I'm sure you know uh, Jim Flanagan. Yeah, yeah. Um, so so we share that in common. But um, all through, I'd say 
my late teens, early to mid twenties, it was, you know, three to five days a week, split routines, hour to two hours. I do 30 minutes of warm up cardio, um, you know, hit the elliptical, then go downstairs and focus on, you know, back day or chest day, or maybe every once in a while, leg day, <laughs> uh, as most people do, I probably skip that one most of the time, but it, it was something I really enjoyed. I just, I did what I thought worked and I did what I saw other people doing. Um, and then when I was 29, uh, I decided to move to Minnesota actually to get sober. Um, so I moved up here and uh, after a few months uh, kind of going through the process of that, I was lucky enough to find a place out in uh, Minnetonka, YZ area out here. Um, called My Strength Studio. So Kevin Ness was the founder of that. It's now called uh, Myo Strong. And I was looking for jobs, different opportunities. I've been in hospitality for a long time. Uh, and I decided maybe strength training would be something that I could pursue as a career. It's something I'd always been passionate about that would be a little more, um, you know, healthful <laughs> for somebody pursuing uh, early sobriety. And Kevin was nice enough to to take me in and show me the ropes. And that's where I learned about, uh, you know, high intensity training. I learned about Arthur Jones principles. I read the Nautilus bulletins. I read a bunch of Ken Hutchins, super slow manual and all of his other writings. And uh, I was just, I was blown away. So my first super slow workout was, I don't even think I made it through all five movements. I think I did a leg press, a, a chest press, a pull down and an overhead press. And I was on the floor for about 30 minutes <laughs> afterwards and the whole workout, you know, only took 10. Um, so that was a, a big aha moment for me. And I, I think that's when the, the light bulb went on and that's when that shift happened. And, you know, the rest, as they say, is history. So uh, interestingly, by the way, I, uh, so we have a commonality. I uh, celebrated 31 years clean uh, last uh, uh, November night. That's amazing, man. Congrats. Yeah, Thank you. that's awesome. Yeah. So um, now at what point in your journey did you wind up meeting Luke Carlson and getting affiliated with Discover Strength? Yep. So so just a little background on Discover Strength. We're a, a evidence-based resistance training company, high intensity training um, located in the Twin Cities, founded by Luke Carlson. Uh, I believe it's 17 years ago now, coming up on 18 years. Um, you can do the math on that. I want to say 2005, maybe that's, right. I think that math is right. Um, but we currently have, let's see, eight locations, nine locations in the twin cities, uh, three franchises. No, I'm sorry. Eight locations in the twin cities about to open a ninth, uh, in Arizona, six owned corporately, uh, two, sorry, three currently owned um, by franchisees. So right. we're spreading rapidly. We're trying to bring this uh, high intensity training thing to, uh, to the masses. And we've got some very ambitious goals and, um, you know, we, we've sort of mixed high intensity training and customer service together in a way that I think is very unique, um, where we're really trying to bring an experience that's replicable, that's high quality, um, you know, we get a lot of flack from other people in the industry because we're maybe not the most strict on certain standards, right? People fall in love with super slow or they fall in love with any particular style of training. And, and to us, it's all it's all good and it's all smart and it's all, you know, as you said, rational uh, and very intense and very effective. Um, and I think that's probably the best way to reach the masses and to do it in a way that's going to keep people coming back for more. So uh, we're trying to do the Lord's work out there, you know, finish what, uh, finish what Arthur Jones started back in the seventies. So. Well, it's interesting over the years. I mean, I, and I, when I first discovered, cause I, I've got a few years on you about 30 actually. And uh, when I first started reading the books by Ellington Darden and, and some of the, where, where I, I never read the uh, Nautilus Bulletins, but I read all the book, everything that Ellington Darden, I mean, I'd be waiting for the next Ellington Darden book to come out and he'd have his routine and, and whatnot. And some of those early books, the Nautilus bodybuilding book and the Nautilus book itself and things like that, um, the sale, if you will, was that Nautilus machines per se and high intensity training was vastly superior 
to the mainstream training. And what I've noticed, and, and this is sort of, I'm alluding to your comment about taking flack for maybe not being as purist as somewhat, is what I've noticed in the last little while is that the, the message has sort of uh, evolved a bit more to, this is the safest and most efficient way which again, I would say that does make it vastly superior because if you wind up hurting yourself or you're unable to keep up the, you know, when you were a young man and you were in college or whatever, going to the gym two hours a day was, was feasible. But once say somebody gets married, starts raising a family, has a full-time occupation that's not in the strength training industry and whatnot, very few people are going to keep up with that for any length of time. So I think the vastly superior part of it is because it is more sustainable. Notice here, I'm making a little pitch from the name of my facility, Sustainable Success, uh, because the time commitment is far less and because the safety aspect is, is also far higher because a lot of people, uh, unfortunately, I think the majority of people who participate in you know, what is broadly referred to as fitness activities wind up with aches and pains and actual injuries as a result of it. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more with you, Richard. And I, I think, you know, it's uh, as, as I've learned more about the exercise science literature, obviously we're big believers in Discover Strength that, um, you know, we read research articles every week. It's, there's a lot of things that are effective, right? But there's not a lot of things that are effective and extremely safe and extremely efficient and will you know allow them to fit into your lifestyle if you're a busy individual and high intensity training checks all those boxes in a way that crossfit or uh typical strength and conditioning power lifting you know explosive training just simply do not right so i i couldn't agree more with everything you were saying there well the, re the reason i i alluded at the beginning that i'm, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with some of the labels one of them being evidence-based training uh, and the reason is, depending on what research you look at, you can find evidence for virtually anything, right? I always yeah. find it's almost like uh, uh, people who are having religious uh, arguments, they can find a quote in whatever, you know, book that they ascribe to, depending on their personal beliefs, you can probably find a quote in any of, you know, whether it's the Bible or the Torah or, or the Quran or whatever, you can find a quote to basically back up anything. And I think if you're trying to make an argument for a specific type of training, you can find a study, uh, you know, and if you looked hard enough, then you can find a study almost that says the exact opposite. Right? Yeah, it's it's not very hard to do that at all. I think the, the evidence-based label, you know, one of your colleagues, I'm not sure uh, if you know Mike Petrella or how yeah. close you guys are together, but he he had a whole diatribe on Facebook a while back about this exact thing and switching from the evidence-based label to, you know, rational training or smart training or however you want to call it. And I couldn't agree more. I think, again, that's another thing that us as people who are super interested in this get lost in the minutia. And it's it's an important label to have, I think, for people who who don't care as much, right? And they're they're just sort of the lay person that's seeing what's out there and using labels like evidence based or efficient or smart or safe. Um, yeah. Just help people sort of sift through all the other stuff out there. But I mean, you're absolutely right. You can find evidence to basically support any crazy crazy fitness philosophy you're looking to to find. So, and, and, and of course, a lot of the research is done over a six or a 12 week period with untrained individuals. So, you know, you do, you take untrained individuals and basically get them to do almost anything for six to 12 weeks and you will see results, right? So uh, now, of course, what, I, what I'm doing here, which is wrong, is I'm making the assumption that somebody listening to this podcast is already familiar with what we do. So would you like, if, if you had to, you know, the expression is, if you had to explain the type of training you, that we do while standing on one foot, in other words, you know, how would you explain in a nutshell what we do and how it may differ from the mainstream and, and why you feel it's superior? 
Yeah, I would say it all comes down to efficiency and effort. Um, I think my my 30 second elevator pitch would be if you do look at the research, if you do look at what's considered evidence based, the preponderance of literature points that intensity of effort is the most important variable for outcomes. Right. So let's shrink the volume of the exercise and instead make it extremely targeted, efficient and super intense. And we'll get the same results in less time. So. What would then for again, I'm asking questions that I already know the answer to, but so you I'm assuming you are an exercise instructor and you're putting clients through workouts on a regular basis. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. So let's say uh, the last person you put through a workout today, what did that look like? I was actually off today, Richard. But, okay, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, so. Yesterday, yesterday I, I was at work. Um, the last person, you know, eight to 12 exercises, typically 60 to 120 seconds of time under tension per exercise, um, focusing primarily on multi-joint movements. But unlike, you know, some stricter philosophies, we add in a lot of single joint exercises as well, just to emphasize um, some other body parts and, and have a more well-rounded routine. But the whole thing can be done in 25 to 30 minutes, you know, once or twice a week. Okay. And speed of movement, does that vary? It does. So we use a, a gauntlet of different exercise protocols, but our standard cadence is just the, the old Nautilus 2-4 cadence. So if you, you look at any of the vintage Nautilus machines and you see sort of the um, instructions that they have on right. all the different machines there, they were very specific about trying to perform approximately 8 to 12 repetitions at a 2-4 cadence. Um, I don't think they mention time under tension, but essentially I'm a, I'm a big fan of Ellington Darden as well. Um, you know, we're looking to be in that, in his mind, I believe it's minimum of 30 upwards of about 90 seconds per exercise. So we do two, four, we do some super slow 10, 10, we do um, a variety of different static um, uh, focused uh, protocols. We do a variety of different negative accentuated protocols. So if Ellington's Darden, Ellington Darden has written about it, we we probably do it at right. Discover Strength at some point. So, uh, do you um, have you read lately some of Ellington Darden's recent writings? Where Ellington Darden, because part of what we do too is based on the idea of exercising until failure or momentary muscular fatigue, or for people who are not familiar with those terms, basically doing as many repetitions in good form as you possibly can before stopping your set. And typically only doing one set, although I, you know, that's one of the things sometimes you take flag for, it's like, oh my God, you've broken a golden rule if you do a second set. Uh, but, but recently Ellington Darden, which, you know, and it's interesting that most of, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, the hit community seems to have ignored him on this. But he's now saying that training to failure is counterproductive and he's advising people to train just short of failure. Have you read some of his latest things? I have not read his more recent stuff. I think it's it's funny. L uh, wrote a lot of work in the 70s, 80s and 90s. And we we kind of joke that, you know, and I've joked with um, Jim about this before as well, is that it's basically just the same book, uh, just re- <laughs> Sure. repurposed yeah. uh, for football or for baseball or and, and don't get me wrong i love his stuff and i think he's a he's a fantastic author and he does a great job of of really breaking down complex ideas into simple things but i think it's an evolution for all of us and ellington is no different than anyone else he's looking to sell books right and if you've been saying the same message for 40 years uh you probably have to come up with a new angle at some point right uh you know i I've seen it. I've seen and experimented with his 30, 30, 30 protocols with his 260, with 30, 10, 30. To me, at the end of the day, it's all about creating similar levels of time under tension and working as hard as you can to that to the end of that set. Right. To whatever the, the end point is of that set. Uh, I think just looking at the literature that I've seen, I'm, I'm friends and colleagues with uh, Dr. James Steele out of Solent University, and he's done some really interesting research on reps and reserve um, for our listeners or viewers that don't know what that is. That's essentially zero reps and reserve would be failure, 
right? right? So if you're doing a set and you get to zero RIR, that's failure. If you get to one RIR, uh, you're just a rep short, two RIR, two rep short, et cetera. Uh, people suck at determining where they are with reps and reserve. So the idea, and again, I haven't read Ellington's recent work, but the idea of stopping short and expecting people who are untrained to know where that stopping point right. would be right. just seems a little ridiculous to me. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think like yourself, having been training for years, I mean, if you're using a weight that you know what you've done with that weight previously, you would have a, a little bit better uh, uh, idea. Uh, but you're right, an untrained person, like even myself, most of my clientele, like today I trained a gentleman who was 80. And uh, and he's been coming with me for a while, and he's a lifelong runner, and he's, he's a very typical uh, very ectomorphic and, and, and fairly actually good shape. And he's taken the precautions that most runners don't. And he's relatively considering 80 years old, relatively injury free considering, uh, you know, but he knew to wear the right shoes and keep his mileage reasonable and do all these things. Still doing far more exercise than I do, but, but he's the exception very much to the rule because I, long time runners come and see me and they're often in really bad shape. Uh, but anyways, uh, as he starts to approach failure, he starts to go, oh, I, I think that's it, Rick. I think that's it. And I, and I think to myself, sometimes I say, well, just try another one and try another one. And I get him to do a couple more, but I don't lose too much sleep over, you know, I'm not trying to get this guy to be on the floor for 20 minutes after he's done his workout, right? He's 80 years old. And every time he comes, I add a little more weight in the machine and I get him to do a little more and he's progressing. And I feel with an older clientele, as long as they're progressing uh, over time, that I feel pretty good because let's face it, when you get to be 60, 70 and 80, uh, you know, father time wants you to go the other way. He doesn't, you know what I mean? He wants you to go backwards. And as long as these folks are progressing, I don't, I don't, I push them, but I sort of respect, I don't know where you fall or if you've got any, uh, uh, you know, different ways of motivating people to work harder or depending on your older clientele, do you feel like a certain level of intensity is good enough type of thing? Yeah, I, I mean, I think you bring up a great point. And again, this is sort of the minutia, but I think it's important minutia for people in our industry um, as opposed to being married to a particular style of training is that, like you said, creating the habit is the most important thing. Um, I've been training this style now for almost, I guess it'll be coming up on six years uh, here in a few months and training, you know, resistance training for 20 plus years, right? I don't think I've ever taken a set of leg press to actual volitional failure, like gun to my head. I think I probably could have gotten three more reps, any leg press I've ever done. And I work pretty hard, right? I work harder than probably 95% of our clients. And that's not to say that people that come into Discover Strength right. don't work very hard, but there's a huge broad spectrum. And I would even argue that in the research we were just talking about, that James Steele research, even with trained lifters who still weren't very good at actually predicting where they were to failure, it depends on the day, right? Mm -hmm. It depends on what happened. Did they argue with their girlfriend? Are they feeling really good? Did they not sleep enough before? Again, I always think of the Arthur Jones sort of stories where he would literally pull a gun out and tell somebody to get five more reps. And without question, they essentially would, right? So have any of us ever actually gotten to failure? Now that sounds like a pretty esoteric question, but I mean that honestly. Today, I train with a trainer I haven't seen in three years. He was the guy who onboarded me at Discover Strength. And I did the hardest set of chest press that I've probably ever done in the last three years because he's the type of person who can get that out of me. Now, I've done some pretty hard sets of chest press, but nobody gets it out of me like Bronson does. And right. then he made me do, uh, you know, three assisted reps together and control the negative. And then he made me drop down and do a set of negative accentuated push ups. And then he made me do four negative only push ups after that. And I thought my chest was going to explode. And do I think that's necessary to get the same results over the long term? Probably, probably not. 
Um, but man, it feels good to be pushed like that every once in a while. And that to me just reinforces this idea that like, I, I think there's very few of us who have ever actually gotten to true failure. So to me, to answer your question, I know this is a really long winded answer, but I think the whole thing is a spectrum. And as long as we're progressing over time, that's all that matters, right? So seeing that progression over the long term is all that matters. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I fully agree. And, and I think one of the things that, um, and I'm forgetting the name of the fellow I did it, his first name is Jeff, a gentleman from Dynavec, you know, where they do the gladiator. Uh, I, I'm baseball. forgetting his last name as well, but yeah, he's, I know, who I know Jeff. Is it Case Bolt? It's something like that. I'm, I'm close to it. But anyways, yeah. he pointed out something that I hadn't considered. With seniors, slips and falls is a concern. So if an, a 75-year-old leaves my uh, facility and his legs are so rubbery that he's unsteady on his legs, you know, there's potentially a safety aspect to that. I mean, if you leave and you're you're a little unsteady on your legs and you happen to maybe slip or whatever, at 35 years old, a slip is probably not a big deal for you. But if you were 80 years old, that might be a different story, right? And, uh, and, and I do notice one thing I concur, I haven't had you the, uh, the experience. I remember years ago, Brian Johnson, do you know the name Brian Johnson from- uh, I do, J-Reps and- yeah, J-Reps and all that. Johnson, I remember yeah. he put me through a workout one time, uh, you know, not different details, but similar, you know, one thing after another, after another. And his driveway, I remember was in his home and his driveway had a steep, uh, steep incline in it. And I really had trouble getting to the street uh, in that steep incline. But but I do notice one thing, and I, I sort of take pride in, you know, uh, working out uh, fairly strictly and fairly high intensity. But whenever I have someone else put me through a workout, it invariably feels harder, right? Even if they're not, you know, pointing a gun to my head or even pushing me. There's just something about having accountability to somebody else that does get you to push that much harder uh, type of thing. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think that's why Discover Strength exists as a company. I think that's why your place exists as a company, right? If, if people would do this on their own, there would be no need for professionals like us. But uh, we know that if you, uh, again, I mean, this idea of failure, I think, I think the term is is such a broad spectrum in the sense of, you know, getting somebody to come in and observe them and do a set of exercise, uh, a single set, a two, let's let's call it failure, that's never trained before. Even if they're well short of actual gun to their head failure, that's way more than they would ever do on their own, right? Um, so having somebody there to hold you accountable, like you said, is, is probably one of the most important things you can do. And it's why I try to have the vast majority of my workouts be supervised. Um, you know, I, I do enjoy going to the gym every once in a while when I'm on vacation, trying, you know, a new gym somewhere and, uh, trying some different equipment I've never seen before. And I feel like I've pushed myself again, pretty hard, harder than most, I would say. Um, but there's nothing like having somebody there to, to really eke that last little bit of effort out of you. Interestingly, recently, I had somebody who viewed one of my YouTube videos of me working out and he made the comment that I was going nowhere near failure. And I, I thought, and I thought, well, yeah, I, I can't move. I can't do another inch. And his definition of failure, and he sent me this other video of these great big jack bodybuilders, like professional bodybuilders. And their definition of failure was, so they're doing like a, a one second up, one second down cadence. Uh, and their definition of failure is when you're no longer able to continue that cadence. In other words, if it starts to take you three or four seconds to do the rep, you've done failure. And I'm going, because I'm doing like 10 second reps or five second reps. And when I stop, I said, well, he said, when your speed slows down, that's failure. I said, well, my speed didn't slow down. It stopped. <laughs> you know what I mean? So stopping is is whatnot. But somehow or other in watching uh, me, and I try not to make faces and grunt and groan. Sometimes though, I get pretty ugly. 
but for the most part, I try to stay stoic. So it may not look to somebody watching a video as though I'm working that hard. But it's interesting that some of the uh, parlance or the um, things that, that leaked out, people who have never heard of Arthur Jones or Ellington Darden and whatnot, words like failure, intensity, uh, time under load, time under tension, these things seem to have migrated into the mainstream. Rarely do people give credit to where those terms first came from. And I, I suspect in the majority of cases, they don't even know where the origin of those terms came from. Yeah, I, I suspect you're right. And, um, you know, it's, it, I, I'm in the same boat as you. You know, I used to be a grunter and a groaner, and I thought that was, uh, you know, how you eat out that last bit of effort, but I try to be as stoic as I can. Now, does that allow me to not get close or as close to failure as I could possibly get? Maybe, but again, I, I think we're we're splitting hairs here and, and going down to the point of what I would say is, you know, the safety aspect is what's most important to me. I've injured myself doing other stupid things in the gym before, and that's something I, I Try to refuse to do going forward. So if I can get to that point where I hit that invisible wall and I feel like there's no way I can go on anymore with good form and I can continue to breathe and try to eke out that last bit as opposed to making all kinds of faces, that to me is the, is the failure that I want to get to. And obviously I, I think for myself and I, I would probably say for you as well, you're you're doing the right thing, right? You're, you've reached close to your genetic potential, you're continuing to, to train hard, you're in your 60s by the math you, you said earlier, and you uh, obviously are healthier than, than most uh, Americans or Canadians even that are in their 60s. So you're doing something right, you know, <laughs> knock on wood exactly. So, well, one of the things I wanted to ask, changing gears a little bit, is when I did the tour of not just Discover Strength, but we went to some other places, but at some of the Discover Strength facilities, one thing that stood out for me was the average age of the trainees, because one thing that seems to be a commonality among people who are doing what I do is it seems that we tend to attract an older clientele. And I had somebody say to me one time, and he meant it as a compliment, they said, what you do is good for old people. And, and it certainly is, although I would say that, you know, you're just an old person waiting in line right now, and you will be before you know it. And any injuries that you or anybody your age gets now will come back to haunt them when they get to be my age. Because I, one thing I've come to believe strongly is the human body heals, but not completely. Uh, it comes back to haunt you later. But discover strength, and correct me if I'm wrong here, because I'm, uh, this is a perception, seems to have done a good job of attracting and keeping various demographics. Because I think in, in, in my case, you know, I rarely, I had a bodybuilder in here once, a guy who was two weeks before a contest, guy was like six foot four, he looked like a Greek god, nice guy and everything else. He went through the workout and here, I'm gonna brag a little bit here, because I didn't know, I said, what, what weights do I put on the machines for this guy? Right. It's his first workout, but he's obviously, you know, a strong guy. And so I used the weights that I use. And here's the bragging part, because he struggled with them. Uh, but partly that's because he's not. I'm sure that in a short amount of time, he would probably leave me in the dust. But he's not used to working out slowly and going to failure and whatnot. But, you know, and he thought it was all quite interesting. He was very respectful and everything else. And then he never came back. Because for him, um, uh, the idea of efficiency and spending less time at the gym was actually not a plus because he likes, he was 24 years old. He likes hanging out in the gym. His buddies are all there and that's his hangout, which is probably better than hanging out in a bar, um, but it wasn't an efficient, but discover strength. I'm off on a tangent of my own here seems to have done a better job than, than some others in attracting various demographics and getting young people. Because for old people that I train older, you know, they've, they have no desire to go in a gym and hang out with big buff guys and whatnot. They just want to be able to play with their 
grandkids and they want to be able to go out for a game of golf and they want to be able to take the groceries in and out of the car and, and avoid walkers and things like that in their old age. But you've gotten some people, I think even some athletes and various people, is that a fair statement? Yeah, I would say that's fair. I think we've done a good job at marketing to an audience that uh, is is really built around efficiency and effectiveness. So our our big pitch, our avatars that we have, the people we look for are busy professionals. And we market all of our advertising to there. Now we get broad ends of the spectrum from that point, but our bread and butter is lawyers, doctors, people who don't have time to waste on exercise that doesn't work. And maybe they've tried five days a week. Maybe they're they're at that point where their old injuries are catching up to them and they're willing to try anything. And they come in and I put them through a workout and I do six exercises with them typically. And I leave them breathless after the leg press and they go, oh my God, I've been wasting my time. You know, and, and that light bulb goes on for them. But you know, to your point, Richard, I, I think the most rewarding people I work with are those older individuals, you know, to to see somebody who doesn't take for granted what you're doing for them and who's not there for a quick fix, who actually understands, like, I want to have my life back and I will spend as much time and money as I need to to do that uh, because they know that the clock is ticking, you know, and, and obviously with 20 year olds, they can get results doing pretty much anything. And there's a lot to be gained from spending time at the gym and, and enjoying that culture. And, you know, I did it. I totally understand it, you know, wanting to go to the gym and, and it's a place to hang out. It's a, it's a fun place to be, especially if you go to a gym, that's got a good atmosphere. I totally understand that. Um, but as we get busier, as our lives get fuller, as we get older, I think having something that's efficient and professional, and you can come in and get a great workout and leave and see results over the long term that's really where we try to appeal to people but i think it's important too that you know we we have this whole thing wrong the way we observe in the fitness industry and doug mcguff talks about this in his book missing the forest through the trees but it's really you know we look at the jacked you know 24 year old your greek god that you were talking about and think oh my gosh what does he do well, he's got great genetics and he can pretty much do whatever. And if you try to do what he does or what a professional athlete does, you're going to blow your knees out. Why don't we look at the 75 year old grandmother who gained five pounds of muscle over six months, which defies all odds and increased bone density and did all those old things. And if it worked for her, guaranteed it's going to work for the 20 year old. So we need to reverse our, our idea and understanding of who we're actually looking to um, as far as motivation and as far as is this effective or not. So one thing that I found, I, I had an in body tool. I have a different body composition tool now. I've come to the conclusion that and, and maybe because you just described somebody putting on five pounds of muscles in six months. Uh, maybe that was just a, a, an off the cuff example, but I found that significant hypertrophy. I see uh, clients gaining a lot of strength, even doubling and tripling strength, uh, but actual muscle hypertrophy, particularly unless I can get them to eat enough protein. Because one thing I've realized is that uh, older people, many, and particularly older women, uh, often are not eating nearly enough protein. They get stronger, but I'm not seeing a lot of actual muscle gain. And I've come to the conclusion, I mean, you and I, were, I'm looking at us on a screen right now, probably, you know, on the street or whatnot, people might not mistake us for bodybuilders, right? So I've come to the suspicion, I, I will stop short of the word conclusion. I've come to the strong suspicion that people who are capable of hypertrophy, the kind that will turn heads, are probably similar in rarity to people who are over six foot five inches tall. In other words, you know, it's pretty far and few between no matter what um, training program you're doing. Yeah, and I, Do, I mean, you I, say I, I'm, I'm, am I wrong or? No, I, I would agree with you 100%. And I think there's a, a few caveats to that. And the biggest one is that people who can see massive increases in strength and size don't need our services. And more than likely, 
they're never going to seek us out. The people who are going to seek out our services are people who are hard to come by uh, right. strength and hypertrophy, right? If you're getting results doing anything and you've had massive muscles your entire life, you're probably not going to go to your shop or to my shop and say, you know what I really should do is decrease my volume by 500% and listen to this guy that I could beat up with one arm tied behind my back, right? <laughs> um so I think I think that's a huge issue with it, right? Is those people are simply not seeking us out. I will say that we occasionally get somebody who is a, a genetic freak. I mean, I've I've got a guy. Uh, you, I think you would be surprised after you do this for a while that occasionally you'll find someone who's just lazy. But man, if they put their mind to it, they could be you know Mr. Olympia. And I'm exaggerating there a little bit, but I've got a buddy I used to train. I'm telling you, Richard, in three months, he put on 15 pounds of muscle and then he stopped and he lost it all. And I don't think he's gained it back since because he doesn't care and he doesn't like working that hard. And he would just rather do his job and go about his life and good for him. But if he comes back again, guaranteed he's going to put that back on. And he probably would have had the capacity to gain another 10 or 15 pounds of muscle too. He's just a genetic freak. But I have seen this in older individuals too. And there's plenty of studies that show um, you know, I think there's a generational issue too, where strength training was just not emphasized for people. So I think in your area, especially working with older individuals, you're going to see over the next 10, 20 years, more people who were not brought up with this idea of resistance training in mind that maybe come to you who can gain muscle, who can hypertrophy. Um, but I think the other, the other big caveat to this too is, the low volume approach doesn't seem to be the ideal environment for maximizing hypertrophy as well. And we can get into a whole separate conversation about, uh, you know, hypertrophy versus uh, strength increases and how they're correlated. But the bigger issue is if you're making older individuals stronger, that's what's correlated with decreases in all cause mortality. So Hypertrophy aside, lean tissue aside, as long as they're continuing to gain strength, and if you can bring someone up a quartile in strength and grip strength, whatever it is, you're going to do a huge amount of benefits to them. So I think we get a little too tied up in this idea of, well, this person's a hard gainer or they're not gaining size. And like you said, it's, it's like finding someone who's 6'5", right? There's just not that many of them out there. But when you see them, man, it's fun right? It's a lot of fun to train somebody who's a, a high responder and anything you throw at them, they'll just, uh, they'll just respond. Well, one of the things that I've pondered, I don't know if you, this has crossed your mind, is that from an evolutionary perspective, the fact that it's so rare leads one to believe that, you know, unusually large muscles are maybe not necessarily the adaptation that, that you want, at least from an evolutionary perspective. Otherwise, there would be a lot more people able to do that. You know what I mean? Like to me, the strength and whatnot. Like I remember, you know, years ago, I started, when I first started in fitness, I read Kenneth Cooper's aerobics. And then I started, you know, it was all steady state activities and things like that. And you were saying about a generational thing and strength training. Because what, what we used to hear was, you know, those bodybuilders, you know, they're just, those muscles are for show. Those guys are all muscle bound and they have bad hearts and they're all heart attacks waiting to happen. If you want to be healthy, you got to go out and jog and you got to go out and swim and do all these things because that's true health and the muscles are just for show and, and for vanity uh, type of thing, right? But to some extent, you know, when you think about health and, and whatnot, as long as you, you get stronger, right? The actual strength, because I used to, I, I, there used to be this thing where uh, in one of the Sherlock Holmes things, um, there was a, a real strong big guy and he was bending a, a steel bar to intimidate Sherlock Holmes. And Sherlock Holmes grabs the steel bar and bends it back. So to me, that was the ideal is that you'd be strong without looking it, you know what I mean? And I, that's why at the beginning, when I first started a little bit that I knew, I thought, well, the power lifters or, or the Olympic lifters, those are the real guys because bodybuilders are just show muscles that are no good for anything type of thing, right? 
And, you know, over the years, you know, I look at now some of the weights that I lift and whatnot. And, you know, if I if I pose in the mirror at the right angle with the right light hitting me uh, and I haven't been overeating too much lately, I look like I work out. But if you turn around and, and I'm bent over tying a pair of shoes or something like that and whatnot, it's like you, you can't tell one way or the other, right? But it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, like I often say, even the people on the magazine covers don't actually look like the people on the magazine covers because they're catching them at the exact right position in the exact right light, not to mention probably some Photoshopping and body shaving and all those other things that comes into play. So now uh, before I want to, one thing I want to cover before I run out of time, because I ran out a little, I've heard different people. Uh, uh, I'm thinking Al Coleman. I'm thinking Fred Hahn, uh, who I've read, who have come to the conclusion that frequency of twice a week is better than once a week. And if you go back to the, um, Body by Science and some of the earlier books and the Mike Menser stuff, they often would go to once a week, once every 10 days, once every 12 days. And I often find that these blanket recommendations I struggle with because I think the answer to that is it depends on a whole bunch of different things. But with Discover Strength, you guys, I think, do a really good job of, of record keeping and tracking things. And I think you even submit some of those things to be analyzed by like for people like Mr. Steele, Dr. Steele and whatnot. Have you come to any suspicions, if not conclusions, that there is one frequency or another that that's better in general? Yeah, I would say uh, twice a week is ideal because it helps keep you consistent. There's no magic to it. I think you can definitely have great results over the long term with once a week training. I actually, at my first job, uh, used to train a guy that was one of those genetic freaks we talked about that would train once every 10 days. And he was, I mean, in about as good of shape as you could possibly be. But again, we have to think about the people that we're dealing with here, the customers and the clients that we're serving. And they are probably not making exercise a priority unless we're making it a priority for them. So finding a way to build something into someone's schedule where whether or not they're feeling good that second workout, they're there. That's going to be the key to creating a long-term habit and long-term retention. I think once a week is fine. And occasionally we'll get a motivated individual that comes in and sticks with that frequency and sees great results over the long term. But more often than not, if somebody's not training twice a week, they're just not going to be retained because they find something else to do or they think it's not enough. And it, honestly, if that's all they're doing and they're not changing any other lifestyle practices at all, it probably isn't enough in the long term. Now, again, they're going to see strength improvements. They're going to see body composition improvements. But if the only thing they're doing is seeing me once a week for 30 minutes and they're not doing anything else to improve their health outside of there, they're probably not going to see the results they want. They're going to blame it on me and then they're going to take their money and go elsewhere. But if I can get someone to commit to twice a week, again, I'm not saying it's better, but if I can get them to commit to twice a week and stay on that Monday, Thursday schedule, that Tuesday, Friday time, get it locked in and it's part of their life now, it's a, it's a habit, it's built into their schedule, man, they're going to see great results over the long term because they've stuck with it and they've created that consistency. So superior from a practical standpoint of, of sticking with it, in other words, based on the idea that the best workout is the one you stick with over the years. The best workout is the one you do, 100%. And I think for individuals like you and I, we can go through those peaks and valleys. And the research is pretty clear, deloading, detraining. Um, you know, you can take a significant amount of time off from work, uh, from working out, from exercise, and not lose a tremendous amount of gains after you've invested some time. But most people aren't going to do that. That's why they come to us, right? They right. need that accountability. They need somebody to hold their hand and, and walk them through this process. And so for me and you, I think, you know, I've experimented with once every 14 days. I've done three times a week. I've uh, added in splits before after reading some Menser stuff and, you know, done once a week body splits where I just do upper body once a week and then I do legs the next week and then I'm back and forth like that. And 
it's, it's all the same in the long term. I like personally training a little more frequently, twice, maybe even three times a week, um, just because I like being in the gym. Right. I've kind of come full circle back to this idea in my 20s of, OK, well, maybe that third workout's not going to be as good, but I just like doing it and I feel better after I do it. And whether or not I'm seeing those increases that I was when I first started, I don't think that matters anymore. I'm creating that consistent habit and sticking with it. Well, what I do, I mean, I, I'm at home right now and you're seeing a little bit. It's dark here. We're having a big snowstorm up there, um, but I sometimes do one or two exercises every day for a while because i mean if i i figure if I, my total sets per week are still usually not even usually less than 15 it really doesn't matter when i'm doing it. yeah right. but again richard most most of your clients i'm sure don't have great setups like you have at home yeah, right so yeah i'm, yeah. The, kid, I'm the kid in the candy store so yeah. what's 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 in the near or uh, distant future for logan is there another book you're working on is there a website are you involved on on um, social media what what's what's keeping you busy these days other than your yes training people yeah so i, I train people full-time at discover strength woodbury um you know that keeps me very busy i also run our own podcast so the discover strength podcast um which is on its third season now uh so that that keeps me quite busy as well um, it's a lot of fun. I really enjoy doing it and have a lot of great uh, evidence-based experts on there as well. So we've had guys like Brad Schoenfeld, Dr. Steele, Dr. Fisher, all names I'm sure you and, and some of your listeners are familiar with. Um, so that's a lot of fun. I really enjoy doing that. I'd love to keep that up. Um, I am working on another book. I just picked it back up after COVID and everything. I, um, you know, kind of put it down for a little bit, um, but I've I, tried to build it back into my schedule and I'm hoping in the next, you know, year or two to, to have something out. And then I'd like to sort of L darden it, right. Have some spinoffs and just keep regurgitating the same stuff in new ways and maybe sell some more books, um, get a publishing deal at some point, who knows? So. Good. Well, what I'll ask you to do is, is please email me with any links or whatnot on how people reach you, how to reach Discover Strength, links to your podcast, because I, I'm, like I said at the beginning, I'm, I'm trying to spread the word. And I don't know that we'll ever be mainstream. Uh, and at one point, I, I think uh, Ken Hutchins said something to the effect that we don't want to be mainstream necessarily. We want to maybe always be a niche type of thing. Um, and, and that's okay. Part of me, I, I, I do sometimes feel like it's an uphill battle, but at the same time, I, I just feel like uh, there's so many people I feel that are wasting time or hurting themselves or not sticking to it that I, I sort of really feel a little evangelical once in a while and saying there's a better way, but you know. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Richard. I mean, I think Ken is is a brilliant mind in exercise science. I think one of the things that this industry in particular has been missing for a while is uh, somebody who's got business savvy and is passionate about uh, smart, effective, safe resistance exercise. And I think that's where Discover Strength fills a void that's been there for a long time since Arthur Jones sort of left. There's a lot of really smart practitioners in our industry, but not a lot of great business people. And a lot of people who share that sentiment that you're talking about with Ken, where it's, well, I'd rather keep this small and I'd rather keep this our little secret. And I couldn't disagree more. I would rather share this with the masses and I think Discover Strength is, is really being evangelical about doing that and trying to get the message out and trying to bring this into homes all over the country. And I think the thing you'll see, hopefully, you know, this is this is sort of one of my long term goals with with Discover Strength is that there'll be copycats, that there'll be other people who are coming into the industry and see the success that we're having and go, we should do that because Wow, they're not injuring people. Wow, their customer service is great. Wow, how can we copy that business model and try to make this even better and more ubiquitous? And, you know, maybe 10, 20 years from now, now we'll be talking about all this stupid CrossFitters back in the day and when people used to get hurt when they were exercising. And hopefully that's not an issue anymore because we've got a lot of overweight, unhealthy, inactive people in your country and in our country. And 
you know, I don't think exercise and resistance training specifically is a cure-all, but it's about as close as it can get. And it's a great starting point, which we just know people aren't doing. So if we can convince some more people to, to do even the minimum effective dose of resistance training, I think we're just going to be happier, healthier uh, yeah. as nations in the long term. So. Well, when we said about, you know, research and evidence base and finding different things and a lot of a lot of research, it's hard to come to real definitive conclusions about, you know, what's good for you, what's bad for you and everything else. But uh, Mike Petrella uh, uses a phrase and when he's onboarding clients and it says, all else being equal, a stronger you is a better you. And, you know, that's pretty undeniable, right? If I make you stronger and I don't hurt you in the process, it, it, you know, it's got to be setting you right. So I will make a confession is that I don't know that I have ever watched any of the Discover Strength podcasts. So I look forward to you sending me a link to that. And of course, I can be an avid sharer of that because I have a, not a huge following, but you know, over the years, I kept getting a lot of connections on LinkedIn and Facebook and all these things, thinking one of these days, this will come in handy. So I do know people from a lot of different places. So I look forward to getting that. And, and I want to thank you for taking the time today. Tonight, we're in the same time zone, right? Uh, I believe so. Is it 6.30 there? Uh, no, it's probably, we started at 6.30. Oh, okay. So you're an hour ahead then. Yeah, an hour ahead. We're central. Yep. Okay. So anyways, thank you so much for taking the time. And uh, I look forward to keeping in touch and I look forward to uh, seeing some of those podcasts and, and sharing them widely. Well, I appreciate that for, for anybody that's interested, Richard, and thank you so much for having me. I don't have a website for the book, but you can find it if you just uh, type in how to look good naked uh, in Amazon. Um, and it's the number two, not uh, uh, written out TW0. Right, right, it's just right. the number two. So how to look good naked. Um, our website is just discoverstrength.com. You can find us in the app store, or I'm sorry, for the uh, podcast store on Apple Podcasts. Right. We're on, you know, um, all the other podcasting platforms. It's just right. the Discover Strength podcast. But I will definitely send you all those links. And thank you so much for having me, Richard. I really appreciate it. Been a pleasure. Hopefully, we can uh, shake hands in person in a not too distant future. Are you coming direct this year? Uh, well, um, hang on a second. I'm going to I'm going to stop recording.